Hello again, 240. In this video, I will begin going over some topics in Chapter 10, Television Changes the Image of American Sports. And this is Part 1 of Pete and Rune. And Burt Bell's death came at a crucial time for the National Football League. In 1959, yet another new rival league, the American Football League. This was the fourth American Football League. The first came in the 1920s with Red Grange and his agent Cash and Carey Pyle. There was another one in the mid-1930s that lasted two seasons. And then the third American Football League lasted in 1940. In 41, it ended because of World War I and it ceased operations and never came back in. And as you'll recall, the All-American Football Conference came in after World War II. But here is the fourth American Football League. The premise of this new league was that it could become profitable from a lucrative television contract. By this time, up-and-coming ABC TV was anxious to get into the football business and was prepared to fork over the princely sum of $2 million for the rights to the initial American Football League 1960 season. The league was the brainchild of 27-year-old Texas oil man Lamar Hunt, who, angry at being rebuffed by the NFL in his attempt to buy an existing franchise and move it to Dallas, decided to create a new league, and he lined up such wealthy investors as Bud Adams in Houston, Bob Housem in Denver, and Max Winter in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to join in his enterprise. And by November of 1959, this also included Ralph Wilson from Detroit, Michigan, who would place a team in Buffalo, New York. He had an eight-team league assembled by the end of 59. Thus, the challenge from the American Football League was on the minds of the 12 National Football League owners when they convened for their annual meeting in Miami Beach in January 1960s. They fired a shot across the bow of the new league by creating two expansion franchises. They launched the Dallas Cowboys and lured Max Winter and the Minnesota Vikings away from the American Football League. They also had to elect Burt Bell's successor. And the meeting turned contentious when vote after vote failed to give one of the top candidates the necessary two-thirds margin. The politicking lasted for ten days before, in exasperation if not desperation. They finally named as their new commissioner the young Los Angeles Rams general manager, Pete Rozelle. An exhausted group of owners could only hope for the best. The 32-year-old Roselle uh, the National Football League Hall of Fame in Canton says he's 33 at this time, but no matter, he did not have a compelling football resume. He had earned a journalism degree from the University of San Francisco and worked in a public relations firm before joining the Rams as a publicist. And in 1957, he assumed the position of general manager. Skeptical journalists thought Roselle looked like a short-timer and caustically labeled him the boy czar. The skeptics were quickly disabused of their initial impressions. Beneath Roselle's calm and friendly demeanor lurked a tough-minded negotiator who would brook neither nonsense nor any challenge to his authority. Soon after taking office, he had the temerity to discipline the recognized father figure of the National Football League, the founding owner and coach of the Chicago Bears, Papa Bear George Hallis. Roselle's first substantive decision gave an indication of what he thought the NFL should be about. He moved the league's headquarters to Park Avenue in downtown Manhattan, out of Philadelphia, where Bell had run the offices, close by the offices of three television networks. He had learned much about dealing with the television industry in Los Angeles, and he correctly perceived that the networks were ready to invest heavily in professional football. From his first days in his new position, Roselle embarked on an audacious plan to tap into television revenues. But first, he had to convince his millionaire capitalist owners of the many blessings to be gleaned from, of all things, socialism. Just as Burt Bell had preached the gospel of maintaining a league of competitive teams, so too did Roselle, but he extended that concept to the point of taking away millions of dollars from teams located in large media markets. Roselle proposed to the owners that the league sell the television rights of all teams in a single package 
and that each franchise share equally in the income. He persuaded the owners that if this were not done, then the big media market teams would dominate the league. In the long run, he argued, sharing revenues would sell the television rights and it would generate more income for everyone by enabling all franchises to field competitive teams. His theory came to be known as league parity. He especially had to win over the Barons, whose franchises were located in the nation's three largest media markets. Wellington Mara of the Giants in New York, Dan Reeves of the Los Angeles Rams, and George Hallis of the Bears. With grudging agreement from these influential owners, Roselle was off to lobby Congress for special legislation exempting the league from antitrust laws. He was rewarded in September 1961 with the Sports Antitrust Broadcast Act, which permitted the leagues to pool their broadcast rights and sell them as a single entity. This could be construed as restraint of trade. That ended all talk about a boy czar. Roselle served as commissioner until poor health forced him into retirement in 1989. He couldn't do anything about 1962 and 3. Those contracts were already locked in, but when the rights for 1964 and 1965 came up for renewal, he orchestrated a highly publicized secret bidding process in which he played each network off against the others. Speculation abounded as to which company would fork over the largest pile of money. And when Roselle opened the sealed bids in a public ceremony, the National Broadcasting Company came in with an unexpectedly high bid of $10.75 million for each of two seasons. And the upstart ABC topped that with a figure of $13.2 million. Roselle then casually opened the final bid. He later recalled, I figured the CBS bid to be anticlimactic, so I opened their bid kind of lackadaisically. The number itself was sitting way down toward the bottom of the second page. I looked at it and, good God, I thought, it's for $14,100,000 a year. The new financial reality of professional football's marriage with television was evident to American Broadcasting Company Vice President Ed Shearick, who thought, good Lord, here we had gone in with more than 26 million bucks, and we'd been rejected. The whole damn network had cost only $15 million in 1951. And there is the late, great Pete Rosell, ladies and gentlemen, National Football League Hall of Famer. And we will conclude this in Pete and Room Part 2.